This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we find history in a trash bin. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. I had a friend in college, a baseball fan. Every day he studied ERAs and batting averages in the paper. He knew everything about baseball. One day I asked which games he went to. He glared down his nose and said, go to? I don't go anywhere near baseball games. Then he pointed to the paper and said, baseball is here. Baseball is statistics. History is like that for most people, events and facts. But sooner or later, the historian wants to go to the game, to really see and experience the past. What was it like to live in ancient Rome, in a medieval castle, or, in this case, in a southern mansion? Texas is fairly young. Only in Galveston could you find 19th century antebellum elegance. The old Ashton House is a mansion that survived the terrible 1900 hurricane to tell us its story. Urban archaeologists Texas Anderson and Roger Moore show how to wring that story from it. An old privy, long since covered over and forgotten, is their main window into the past. Not just an outhouse, but rather a general trash dump. A huge hole in the ground, no longer septic, it contains layers of trash that reveal the quality of life from the late 1850s up through the late Victorian period. The house was built by James Brown, a wealthy businessman. He kept slaves before the Civil War, and the house is very well made because he used the work of slave craftsmen instead of manufactured materiel. Galveston rode out the Civil War better than most of the South, and so did Brown. After the war, he furnished the house with fine European porcelain. His family ate inch-thick T-bone and porterhouse steaks. They disdained chicken and pork. They used elegant wines and cognacs, but not hard liquor. The ladies imported French perfume and expensive facial astringents. Brown's business involved selling the new 19th century technologies to the West. His mansion displayed all the latest stuff, the first flush toilets in Galveston, the first electric lights, only a few years after Edison introduced them. Sifting through century-old detritus, we begin to sense the finery and feel of the place and to know the actual people we begin to really understand the combined tyranny and vision that Brown represented. To merely say that he exploited slaves or brought technology to the West is like trying to see baseball in newspaper statistics. But the intimacy of an accurate look into the drawing room or the servants' quarters is understanding of a whole different order, even when we see it through a trash heap. A battle is going on in New York City. A pretty two-and-a-half-story house in Flushing is scheduled to be torn down. It's one of those nice old gingerbread Victorian affairs. The people fighting its demolition want to see it made into an historical memorial to black scientists and engineers, and especially to Louis Latimer, who lived his last 20 years in the house. Latimer was born in 1848 in Boston, his father had escaped from slavery in Virginia. Latimer went to work doing odd jobs when he was 13. At the age of 15, he joined the Union Navy for the rest of the Civil War. When he was 17, he became an office boy for a firm of patent attorneys. Latimer had the sort of omnivorous mind that keeps finding things to chew upon. When people in the office weren't looking, he wrote down titles of drafting texts. Then he went off to find cheap copies at used bookstores. He taught himself drafting and was soon making patent drawings for the firm. In fact, he made the patent drawings for Alexander Graham Bell's new telephone. But Latimer wasn't content to draw on other people's inventions. In 1879, he went to work for Hiram Maxim at the American Electric Light Company. That was the year of Edison's first light bulb patent. In 1880, Latimer provided Maxim with an improved incandescent filament. Maxim responded by making Latimer his chief electrical engineer. He put him in charge of installing plants and electrical lighting systems, both here and in England. In 1884, after he'd patented several lighting improvements, 
Latimer was hired away by the man he so greatly admired, by Thomas Edison. Six years later, Latimer published the first book on these wonderful new lights, titled Incandescent Electric Lighting. Latimer lived until 1928, until he was 80, and he did everything. He wrote poetry and music, he worked for civil rights, he painted, and he taught English to immigrants. At one point he wrote, Keep in touch with the world. The days that are ours are fleeting. Not a bad thought. Louis Latimer is telling us that we have to stay in the ring. We have to use our time and abilities. That's certainly what he did. He started out as a boy with nothing but his brain and a fine natural optimism, and he made superb use of them. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. Today, let's talk about coffins and harpoons. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Call me Ishmael, says the narrator of Melville's Moby Dick as he walks through New Bedford in the 1840s. He's looking for cheap lodgings. He comes to an inn run by a man named Peter Coffin. The rooms are filled. The best coffin can give Ishmael is the other half of a bed occupied by a mysterious harpooner. The harpooner turns out to be a wild, tattooed native from New Guinea named Queequeg. Queequeg and Ishmael are soon close friends. Then we meet the other two harpooners who ship with Captain Ahab, an Indian named Tashtego and an African, Dagu. None of these three quarterbacks of the whaling team are white. That matches what history says about New England whalers. By 1840, one New Bedford or Nantucket citizen in 15 was a free black, often a craftsman. Those were cosmopolitan centers. Background meant little, what you could do meant everything. In 1841, when he was 24, Frederick Douglass, the former slave and abolitionist orator, went to New Bedford to work in shipbuilding. He found blacks were better off in the whaling towns than anywhere he'd been. He addressed his first white audience in Nantucket. Here, the Moby Dick connection rises unexpectedly. The person who extended the invitation to speak was one William Coffin. Coffin was a well-known name in New Bedford. I don't know if there really was an innkeeper named Peter Coffin, but there was a Coffin Wharf. In 1836, a blacksmith named Lewis Temple set up shop on Coffin Wharf. Temple was one of many black inventors among the whalers. In 1848, he invented the toggle harpoon. It had a toggle device that latched into the flesh of a whale and anchored a line connecting back to the whale boat. Melville wrote Moby Dick a year later, and it is rich in technological metaphors. The lines that bind the whalers to the whale are woven through the story. The problem of anchoring lines in a whale is a central motif. In the end, Ahab is tied to Moby Dick by tangled lines and carried down into the sea. Only Ishmael survives the encounter with Moby Dick. And how is he saved? Well, Queequeg had seen death coming and built his own coffin. As the ship sinks, that coffin bobs to the surface and becomes Ishmael's lifeboat. The tale begins and ends with coffins. Melville spoke in a language of deep-running metaphors, like Queequeg showing us 19th century racism, not just as it was, but also turned upside down and inside out. Now, out of the metaphor of the harpoon and the coffin and the metaphor of Queequeg, emerges the very real blacksmith, Lewis Temple, on Coffin Wharf. It's more than just Temple, of course. Melville has summoned up an important early port in the long, still unfinished voyage toward racial equity in America. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work.